Yeah, hello, good evening. Tonight we're going to be talking about the doctrine of eternal judgment. We're going to be looking specifically at the judgment for those who are not saved or those who don't hear the gospel, particularly who don't hear the gospel and die, let me say, in that state. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. I'm going to read again from verse 1 through 3. It says that, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance. Notice that it says the foundation. It says we're going to move on to perfection. So what happens, unfortunately, is that a lot of churches preach everything but the foundation. But in order for you to build any solid structure, you got to build it with the foundation. So the Bible says that for us to build, for us to move on to perfection or to build on, we've got to lay this foundation. And it mentions the foundational things that it says repentance uh, from dead works. It says faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms. If you notice, the Bible says baptisms here, plural. But unfortunately, we have churches and denominations that only teach about one kind of baptism. And they just stop there. They don't teach other types of baptisms. So they are really robbing their members of foundations, of fundamentals. And you can imagine when the Bible says that if the foundation be shaken or be removed, what can the righteous do? So you, I have a lot of believers, a lot of Christians who have come to the altar, but they have not gone, even they have not even been, they've not even laid foundation teaching on their lives yet. So there's a lot of conflict about issues. I believe if you don't understand these fundamental, these basic things, when you come to church, you will, you will, you, there'll be a lot of, let me say, uh, confusion in your mind because nobody has helped you to see these fundamental, these foundational issues. Then it may we will do if God permits. That means it's important. It's very vital for every believer to get this foundation. It's very important for every believer to have it really rock solid so they can build their lives better. You know, unfortunately, people have not been taught about laying of hands, for example. So when they watch TV and watch a minister or they're in church and their pastor lays hands on someone and the person maybe falls down, falls out, like we say, what they say, oh, he pushed him down. Or, or you hear this like, oh, he had an electric, he had some electricity in, in a ring and when he touched him, he zapped him. You know, that was how the guy fell out. You know, these are the kind of things you've heard in the media. I meant as people in the church, people who are born again, when I say people in the church, people who are born again, buy into that stuff. And the reason why they buy into it is that unfortunately their denominations have not taught them these things, have not shown that these are fundamentals, foundational stuff that every believer needs to understand, needs to know, or needs to seek to know. The church must be able to empower or teach or instruct their members on these fundamental things before you can build, before you can move on to perfection. The word perfection there, if you look at, let's go back to verse verse 1 again. That word, let us go into perfection, that word perfection is maturity. It doesn't mean perfection in the sense that you're going to be sinlessly perfect. It's speaking about maturity or the process of maturing. So what it says that we need to put these foundational things, these fundamental things, these basic doctrinal things, we need to have them in place before we can now build and mature the saints and build and teach on other things. So tonight we're going to be talking about the subject of eternal judgment, but we're, we're going to look at one aspect of it. Let me just kind of paint a brush. Let me let me let me just uh, paint a broad spectrum, just you know, broad uh, spectrum of, of of judgment, the concept of judgment. I'm going to let me. I'll paint and I'll go back to the beginning and, and I will try. We we'll, we'll kind of uh, uh, travel from the beginning, but let me paint a broad spectrum for you guys. Um, when people die, there are going to be, let me say, two categories of people that die. One category of people that die are people who were saved, or people who got saved, or people who got judged righteous. Let me put it that way. God judged them righteous, okay? And then those that did not, were not judged righteous. Those that God, those that were judged righteous, when they die, they go to the presence of God right now. Okay, right now they go to the presence of God. They we shed our physical body, our skin, and we go into God's presence with our spiritual body, not a physical body, but a spiritual body. We're able to stay where God is, and that's in heaven. Now, those that die who are not saved, they do the same, they shed their physical body, but they go to hell, they don't go to heaven. Okay, once a person is not born again or is not judged righteous by God, they go to hell, they don't go to heaven. But when a person is judged righteous by God, they go to heaven. Now, people who are who are born again will never go through what is will never go through under judgment for sin again. Once you're born again, 
you will never be judged for sin again because Jesus has paid the price for sin already. God, when, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he, God put the judgment of sin on Jesus. All the sins of the world were put on him. So he paid the price for sin. Therefore, all the punishment that was supposed to, that we were supposed to get as people, Jesus took on all the punishment, all the anger of God, the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus on the cross. Therefore, anybody who puts faith in the finished work of Christ or what Christ did on the cross will not go through wrath anymore, will not face that kind of judgment anymore. Okay? But those that die in their sin and never accepted the finished work of Christ, the Bible says that they will face what is called the white throne judgment. The white throne judgment is simply this. It says judgment that says to the person, Jesus died on the cross, you heard the message, you rejected the message, therefore you rejected the finished work of Christ, therefore you rejected your way out. Okay, let's let's try and put it this way. We we're all in the building that was burning. We we're all in the building, the building was burning down, the building of sin. All of us were burning up, we we're, bur were burning up in that building. And then Jesus comes and opens the door, give, grants us a right of passage, opens the door and says, hey, here's a free pass. It's called salvation. Now, people that choose to receive that message, they escape from that fire. They escape from that burning. But those that reject that message, they stay there. And when they die, that fire they're in is turned into eternal fire, as it were. I'm just giving you a, broad, a very broad, you know, basic understanding of it. But now the saints, the Christians, those who accepted the work, the finished work of Christ, what happens to them? Are they going to go through judgment? Yes, they would. But the judgment they're going to go through is what is called the judgment seat of Christ. That judgment seat of Christ is a judgment of works that they did. What works? Not the works of sin again, because Jesus already paid the price for that. In fact, let's let's kind of let's kind of let's delve into that a little bit before we, we go into the other thing. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 9 through 11. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11. So the person who dies, who is a Christian, will go through a judgment. That judgment is called the judgment seat of Christ. It's not, it's not the same judgment as the unbeliever goes through. The unbeliever goes through what is called the white throne judgment. We're going to study that maybe next week, or maybe the, not next week, the week after next, when I, when I, when I have to teach again. You know, the unbeliever goes to what is called the white throne judgment. And that judgment is an eternal judgment for sin. And not for sins, but for sin. Now, what sin? I'm going to show, well, we'll look when we, when we deal with that, we'll talk about that. But the sin is simply this. Christ died, rejected the way out. And now, here you are. You're, and God will just simply show the unbeliever, this is what awaits you. This is what you've earned by your refusing this way out. But for the Christian now, this is where I'm going now. For the Christian, there's what's called the white throne judgment. So let's look at, sorry, not ju the judgment seat of Christ. Sorry, not white throne, judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 11. Is it, I think it said seat of Christ? Seat, like a seat where you sit down. S-E-A-T. Okay. Yeah, judgment okay. seat okay. of Christ, where you sit down. Now. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 11. It says, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things that are done in his body, according to that which he had done, whether it be good or bad. And it says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men, but we, we, we are made manifest unto God, I trust that we are also made manifest unto your, in your conscience, in your consciences. So you see, the Bible speaks about introducing this concept of the judgment seat of Christ. And this judgment seat of Christ, what, what basically it entails is God will judge the believer according to what he has done. God will judge the believer, the saint, according to what he has done in the body. Now, now like I said, it's not, it's not a judgment of sin because sin has been taken care of already. It's not a judgment of sin. Rather, it's a judgment of the works of that believer. And the Bible says, it says also that in that judgment, some people, their judgment will be, will be, um, okay, look at 1 Corinthians 9, so we can see it, we can see the context of 1 Corinthians, sorry, chapter 9, from verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, from verse 4. This is talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Now, in this judgment of the believer, it's not a judgment of sin. I need to make that very, very clear. It's not a judgment of sin. 
Why? Because the believer is already, I mean, our sins have already been taken care of by Jesus. Jesus Christ's death on the cross has already paid the price for our sin. Therefore, we will never be judged again for sin. We will never be judged again for sin. But what we are going to be judged, the motives for what we have done. The motives, our motivation for what we have done. Did I say first? Did I say chapter 9? I'm sorry, chapter 3. I apologize. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13. You're going to see that very clearly now. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13. I'm sorry, that's, I, was, I was referring to a different reference. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13. The motives for what we have done is going to be judged. And therefore, that would also determine the basis for reward. For eternal reward. Let, let me say this. One of the things that we have to be careful about is not to be so earthbound. What do I mean by earthbound? Not to be so caught up with our 80, 90 years, 120 years on the earth. And sometimes some believers get caught up with that, with the fact that we are going to be here, for, oh, somebody's here for 80, and want to make the best of our 80, 90 years to maximize life on the earth. And that's great. Of course, I believe that you should live well on the earth. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So the earth belongs to you as God's child. You should enjoy the earth. But you don't need to be earthbound in your thinking. You need to understand this earth is just a transitionary place. Eternity awaits us. And therefore, I want to be acceptable unto God for eternity. I want to, be, I want to get eternal rewards. I don't want to be, get caught up with just accolades and, and rewards on the earth. Thank God for accolades and rewards and medals and all them things. Thank God for certificates of accomplishments and those things. But those are temporary rewards. They don't mean nothing in heaven. They don't mean nothing in heaven. They mean they might mean a lot to people here. But in heaven, God judges the mood of the heart. A man could do some things on the earth here and you say, oh wow, what a great man. But God's looking at his heart and God says, no. He didn't do it from a pure heart. He did it to be seen by men. He's already gotten his praise of men. Now look at 1 Corinthians 3 verse 13. In fact, let's, uh, da, 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 da. let's start from verse 10. According to the grace of God which is given unto me, I said, why is Master Builder being, he said as an apostle, he says, I've laid the foundation and another builder thereon, but let every man take heed how he builds thereupon. For other foundation can no one lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Verse 12. Now this is important. This is very this is where we're going to now. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. Now, when it's talking about man, remember it's talking about building on Christ. He told you foundation on Christ. So every man here is speaking about every man who is in Christ. It's not every man who is in the world. It's not talking about the unbelievers who are in the world. It's talking about the body of Christ, Christians. Because he spoke about the foundation laid, which is Christ. And it's talking about building on that foundation, which is the foundation of Christ. So when you're born again, your Christ is already your foundation when you're saved. Now it's talking about how do you build your life on Christ. That's what it's talking about here. Okay? It says that every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it. Now, when it says declare, the day is what? The day of judgment. The day of that judgment seat of Christ. Declare it to make manifest. Will make it evident. When that time of, when that judgment comes, that judgment will expose. That's another way to use the word declare. To expose, to make manifest, to, 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 uh, 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 to reveal. That's another way to look at it. Okay? Declare it because it shall be revealed. Okay, use the word revealed again. Revealed by fire. And the fire shall, Try every man's work of what sort it is. Now, when it says fire, there it's not. It's a it's it's a figurative term. Okay, don't forget this was written how many years ago? Over two thousand years ago, about two thousand years ago. This Bible, this Bible was written. So it's a figurative term of trying. The way they proved things, the quality of stuff back in those days was by fire. You know, and of, even even till now, it's still done that way. But let, let's go on. If any man's work abide which he had built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You are dealing with eternal rewards. These are not temporary rewards. Eternal rewards. Okay? Let's go on. Let's go on. Uh, okay. That's fine. We'll start. Let's stop there. I think, let, let's leave that. Let's stop there for now. We can, we can deal with, we can kind of look at this, the context here. In fact, let's look at the next verse. Know you not that you are the temple of, the, of God? And that the Spirit of God dwell in you. If any man defy the temple of God, himself shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, we temple ye are. So basically, it's talking about what we do in the body. What we do in the body is very God. God is very, uh, uh, God is aware of what we do in the body. But the motive for why we do what we do, 
It's really what God is going to judge. God is going to judge what we do and why we do what we do. Okay? In the book of James, it tells you clearly that it's not just what you do. It, it's, 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 it's what comes from the inside. God looks at what you do, your motive for doing things, your motivation for doing things as, as a basis, as a base for him to accept what you did. And then God looks at the quality of what you did also. Apart from the motivation, the quality of it. So that's why the, that's why it begins to tell you different things. It mentions gold. It mentions silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or stubble. If you burn gold, what happens? Impurities get out of gold. Pure gold comes out of it. If you burn, if you burn, and then the, the impurities in, in gold are less than impurities in silver. At the, the lower you go, the more the impurities. Then it mentions some people are hay and stubble, like paper. When it burns, what happens? There's nothing left but chaff. But the Bible says something very clear here. If you look at that, if you look at, uh, um, if you look at verse 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he himself shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So that individual who did not do anything for the Lord on the earth, when he lived in the world, he was not doing anything <laughs> from, for the Lord. He was just basically, quote, he was so caught up with enjoying planet earth and we are not realizing that Jesus said clearly lay not up treasure on the earth where moth and rust corrupt but he said lay up your treasure in heaven that's what Jesus said there's no moth there's no rust there's no nothing now corrupted so that individual who was building their lives on the earth having a good time just living and just you know living the daily life and just do it and not really investing to their spiritual life and not investing to other people being a blessing to other people with the gospel that is not just being a nice guy. Because sometimes we think being a nice guy is enough. No. Being a nice guy, anybody can be a nice guy. But I'm talking about influencing people for the kingdom of God. Influencing folks for the kingdom. Because that's what's going to last. That's what God is going to look at in the long run. You see, God did not put us in this earth so that we can just occupy space and just enjoy creation. God put us in this earth right now where we are. People are dying. If people die, they go to hell. Okay? If they don't accept, accept Jesus. So God put us here to represent him. We're ambassadors of Jesus. And therefore, we should always be seeking for different ways, creative ways to, 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 uh, uh, to build bridges between people and God. The Bible calls us a royal priesthood. A priest is someone that builds bridge between God and man. And we are here as God's ambassadors. We are royal priesthoods. We are ambassadors of God, ambassadors of Christ. Our job is to tell people out there, that, look, your sins are forgiven you. Christ has died for you already. You don't need to stay your sin anymore. You don't need to, you know, to stay in that condition anymore. Christ has died for you to redeem you from this stuff. So why don't you accept Jesus and you begin to, you enjoy eternal life here on the earth. And then when you die, you'll continue eternal life in heaven. You know, that's why we're here. So when a believer gets caught up with where they are, you know what happens? Heaven is no, heaven is not in pressure that person anymore. Of course, you're still God's child. You still get to heaven. When you get to heaven, God will say, well, sorry, you got no reward, bro. And you, or sis, and you be like, why? He said, because you had a chance on the earth. You can't have a redo now. You know, you had a chance on the earth. You did not do what you were supposed to do there. Why should you now want to get the reward of those that worked hard? Those that did what they had to do. I mean, so for us, it's very important we understand the judgment of Christ. And we're gonna, I'm going to teach on that and that time. Okay, I just gave you guys a, a listen on it. Now, going to the other subject, the, going towards the subject of judgment for those who don't, who never accept Christ. I want us to kind of backtracking into the beginning if you remember at the beginning god said let us make man after in our image and after our likeness and all that let him have dominion just the one verse 26 27 28 and god said let him have dominion over the fish of the sea the fall of the earth uh, the fall of the air and all that stuff you know? now what did god do what god did was that god was giving man what is called delegated authority delegated authority now, what does that mean? That means God owns everything. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But then what did God do? God gave man, let's go to Genesis 1, 26, 27. God gave man delegated authority. Or in our, in our modern day times, power of attorney. God gave man power of attorney or gave man the lease over the earth. That's what God did. When a landlord signs a lease and gives someone, okay, that individual can function in that place however they want to function. Therefore, they are literally the God in that place. They control what happens there. They don't own it, but they control it. They don't own it, they manage it. They don't own it, they are stewards over it. And they say, this lease, leases have a term and a term limit. After that term, you, uh, your, your lease is up. So God gave man a lease over the earth, a lease term. 
That's what we see in Revelation. When we Revelation, we find that God is going to destroy this earth the way it is and redo it on earth again. Okay, because the term, the lease of man is going to expire at some point. It has not expired yet. We're still here. Okay, but look at Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. It says, And God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that, ha that creepeth upon the earth. Look at verse 28. I'm skipping to 28. It said, God blessed them and said unto, unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing that creepeth upon the earth. And, all that. and then it goes on. Now, when you look at that, you begin to wonder, who did God give dominion to? Let's kind of let's define that. I'm going. I'm. I'm still going to get on that subject. I was going. To, I. I told you guys, but it's important we understand uh, from this from this from, the, from this foundation. Okay, God gave dominion to man. He did not give dominion to Christians or to non-Christians. He gave it to man, to Adam and Eve, who were representative of the whole of creation. So the dominion over the earth, over the resources of the earth, is given to mankind. Okay, so what happens is that there are some people whether they are Christians or non-Christians, begin to understand the laws that govern the earth, the resources, and begin to mine into them, begin to come up with ideas. And therefore, they are able to maximize the earth. Because God told us, subdue the earth, control it, subdue it. You know, He gave us a lease, He gave us a, a delegated authority, responsibility over the earth. Some people decide to go inside and mine it. Some Christians, unfortunately, are so heavily minded that they, they, they don't, they're not good on the earth. They want to go to heaven so bad that they don't go into the earth and begin to destroy these things. Meanwhile, the Bible says the earth is the Lord's. That means God owns it. I told you before, ownership and, and lease hold, hold, holding are not the same thing. The earth belongs to the Lord. He owns it. And God, the Bible says God has given the earth to the sons of men. He has given that to the earth. The earth belongs to us. God gave the sons of men the earth. In, when I say give, in sense of lease holding, not ownership. But So we have power of attorney from God to manage the resources of the earth. Okay, So it's important we understand that. Now, where this is where judgment becomes relevant. We all know in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sinned against God, the earth of the tree of knowledge, of knowledge of good and evil, which represented the nature of the devil. Now someone says, why was that tree there? If you look back at the beginning, before man, sorry, you find that in the book of uh, Ezekiel 27, uh, 28, sorry, in Jeremiah 14, it begins to talk about, about, uh, about um, Lucifer, Isaiah 14, uh, Ezekiel 20, 28. It begins to talk about Lucifer and the fall of Lucifer, the fall of Satan, the archangel and all that stuff. It begins to mention about that. And then when that happened, God kicked out Lucifer. The authority Satan had over the angels, God took it, basically God kicked him out of that authority in heaven and cast him down the earth. So God kicked de the devil out of heaven, authority, and threw him down to the earth. So Satan basically was hauled to the earth. He began to operate in the earth with his demons and all that. Okay? So God says, okay, hmm, this guy is a renegade. This guy is, you know, he's, he's, he's a renegade right here. So what did God do? God said, I'm going to make man somebody that I prefer to stay in the earth. So God put man here, and when God put man here, God now gave man authority over everything, including the devil. Adam and Eve had authority over the devil, over everything that was on the earth. Because the devil, Satan, was not, was not in heaven. He was cast out of heaven to the earth. Therefore, the authority over Satan, even in the, in the earth, man had authority over Satan in the earth. Okay? So um, the, the devil now comes to, uh, to Adam and Eve and deceives them and all that stuff and they buy into. So here's what happened. Satan, remember when God cast him out here, he was like a little kid throwing tantrums. Like you send your child, send a, a child to you, go to your room and the child, that was Satan. He goes and he destroys the earth. And that's why we see in Genesis chapter 1 that the earth became without form and void, darkness upon the face of the deep. So God said, I'm going to create a man. After my image, I'm going to give him the authority over that earth again. That I'm Listen to this now. I'm going to create a prototype of heaven. I'm going to create a place that's like heaven, the Garden of Eden. Then I'm going to let this man, because he told, okay, wow, before, before, let, let me, uh, go, go back to your Bible. 
Go back to Genesis chapter 1. You're going to see a word. There's a word there that kind of has jumped at me all this time. Genesis chapter 1. Look at verse uh, Look at verse 28. God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. The word replenish. Then look at what it says. Also after it replenishes and subdue it. That means that there are some elements in the earth that needed to be subdued. God, if 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 all that God created, we saw, we looked down at the end. God created everything and it was good, okay. And the Bible says God told man to replenish and subdue. Replenish. What does that mean? Make it fill up again. That which is lacking, fill it up again. That's to replenish. Subdue means take things and put them in control. Who was man supposed to be in control of? Satan. Supposed to be in control of Satan and everything else, all his cohorts. So Satan comes in and sneaks in through a back door as it were, and Adam did not stop him. Adam could have told, could have told that, that snake, get behind me, or basically he could have cursed that snake, and that would have been the end of this whole thing. He could have chosen not to eat of that. He could have taken some way and cut down that tree. He had the right to because God gave him dominion, but he did not do it. Okay, so basically, here is what happens. Man now gave his least hold holding over to the devil. Through by man committing the sin of high treason. What's high treason? Treason is this something belongs to me. I tell you to take care of it for me. I come back and give it to somebody else. That's what happened. God gave man dominion over everything, and man took it and gave it to the devil. So what happens? The devil now became what is called the God of this world. So the position Adam had before. All what you see in Genesis chapter 1, 26 up to 28, Satan now took over that, that position. Okay, let me show you some scriptures. Look at, uh, uh, look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. It's important we understand these things because when we understand it now, you will now see the importance of reaching people. Oh, well, but let me, let, me, let, me not, let me not jump, let me not jump the gun. We're, we're going. Uh, when you say he's replenishing the earth, you mean replenish it with with more men, like as if they were men before, or replenish it more like just with stuff like we're men, but maybe there were things there before us, no. not men, but some other animal. No, because if it was if it was us, he would have, he said multiply, multiply is that's what be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That means that the earth was not in its com was not in its completed state yet. Let's put it that way. I believe this is what I believe. God's intention was that man will see the Garden of Eden as a prototype. The man will go with the same concept of Garden of Eden and take it and, and basically uh, uh, replicate the same thing all over the earth. Remember the, ch ch chapter one: the earth was without form and void, darkness upon the face of the deeps. So God created, God recreated things and created a garden. So the garden was to be a prototype for Adam. I believe that Adam was supposed to take that same prototype and go and, let me say, and spread it all over the world. Because Satan had messed it all up in chapter, chapter 1, verse 1, verse 2. The earth was without form and void, darkness upon the face of the deep. If you look at Isaiah, look at chapter 14. If you look at Jeremiah, Ezekiel 28, you'll see all that. Satan was hurled down to the earth and Satan basically, he destroyed a whole bunch of stuff that God created at that time. Now, there are certain things that we, that we might not, uh, uh, that we are not privy to, but we can, we can through the spirit of revelation, we can understand that there were, there were nations before us on the earth. There were cities before us on the earth. If you look at Ezekiel, you see that. If you look at Isaiah, you see that. There were cities and nations before, before us. Now, who were the inhabitants? I believe it was angels. I don't believe it was under race of human beings. I don't believe that. You know, some UFO or some weird. No, no, I don't. I believe it was angels that were here before us. Okay? That's what I believe. Because when you look at the fact that Satan was able to deceive a third, a third of those who were part of God's, let me say, God's kingdom at that point in time, which was the angels. I believe that they were the ones who lived here and had their own cities. Now, what kind of structure the cities? I don't know. What kind of animals? We don't know who lived here before us, but I believe that from when you, when you look at Ezekiel and look at Isaiah and, and imply from it, you can make that implicate you can make those impl impl uh, implications as well from that from that sense. So I believe that when Adam when 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 Lucifer was cast out of heaven and cast to the earth, 
and his dominion, his domain became the earth. Okay, I believe he began to break up things like a child, like a, a kid who was kicking up and, and acting up and, and, and just, you know, uh, cutting up as I said in the south and, and just, just throw a tantrum. He began to destroy God's creation. So God brought man now in his own image to be like him, to recreate, to just re take the same prototype and just bring it, take it all over the earth. I believe that. But, but we, like I said, we don't, we don't see that clear in the Bible, but we see this. Look at 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. It says here, In whom, or let's start from verse 3, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Now these are the people who are lost, not saved. It says, In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So who is this? That's all of humanity. All of humanity did not believe in Christ. Everybody who is not born again, which was you and I before we heard the gospel, did not believe in Christ. So Satan was ruling over all of us. He was called the God of this world. He was not called the God of this earth. He was called the small God, small G, God of this, of this world. Not the God of this earth, because the earth belongs to the Lord, the fullness thereof. But because Adam gave him the lease, Adam took the keys of authority that God gave him and gave it over to Satan, Satan began to run the earth. And therefore, he was called the God of this world. Therefore, he was called the small G. Let me go. Another way to prove that Satan was the least holder now of the earth because of Adam's sin. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, when they ate of that tree of knowledge of good and evil, which represented the nature of the devil, what they did was they basically signed the lease. That was like a lease signing ceremony. They signed over the lease of the earth to Satan immediately. Signed over the lease, the authority that God gave them, they, they signed over to Satan. To manage the earth. So Satan now is the manager of the of the world. He manages like a manager. If you go to a restaurant and the restaurant, if you go to like say um let's say Burger King, and the Burger King Corporation, generally speaking, they're good. I mean good stuff. But if you go there and the manager is a lazy guy, he's a dirty guy, he's a guy who doesn't pay attention to details, that particular franchise could look very nasty. Even though the owner, even though the ownership, the management, the corporation. It's a professional corporation, but that guy could be just somebody with a riffraff who doesn't know how to do things right. That's what basically the earth has become. God gave man the authority, dominion, and man gave over to the devil, and the devil now, quote unquote, runs the show. Hence, you find that if you, hence you find that many times it looks like in the natural, people who are doing unrighteous stuff seem to prosper. Now, let, let me quickly balance that out quickly. Let me say, let me balance that now. Here's the problem. God, when you get born again, I'm jumping the gun, three hoops up ahead. When you get born again, the authority of the earth is restored back to you. When you get born again, you are a child of God. The Bible says you are a joint heir with Jesus. The authority of the earth is restored, is restored back to you. But the only way you can function in that authority is when you are in subjection to Jesus. And when you are submitted to Jesus, when you are submitted to scriptural principles. When you do scriptural principles, then you, the authority you have, okay, just like Adam. Don't forget, the, the way Adam would function and be able to subdue the earth was under God. When Adam now under the devil, he could not function effectively as freely as he, he was able to, he was supposed to function before. Same way with the word man. Same way with the born-again Christian. As a born-again child of God, God does not force you to obey him. God does not force you to give the tithe and offering or force you to to preach to anybody or force you to read your Bible or pray. He will never force you. People say, oh God will, some people pray, God break me. God will never break you. He will never, you're not a zombie. So as a child of God, as a Christian, you still have the right and responsibility to yield yourself to God. If you look at the story of the prodigal son, when the guy said, father divide unto me, the father divided to him, guess what? The father did not chase the boy. If you notice that, the father did not run after the boy, say, hey, don't go, don't go. The father did not do that. The father let him go. That's how God is. He's a free moral agent. He gives us free moral agency, free will to choose. So basically, when Adam and Eve sinned, they gave that right over to the devil to run the show. Now, let's, let's further confirm this. Look at Luke chapter 4. Let's confirm this through the mouth of Jesus himself. Luke chapter 4. We're going to confirm just the lease of the earth. Luke chapter 4 from verse 5. This was Jesus at the temptation. Let's see this. This, uh, this is a very uh, interesting concept here. Luke chapter 4, Jesus had temptation. Luke chapter 4, verse, uh, verse 5. It says there, I'm going to read through verse 8 from verse 5. It says, um, 
Glory. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain, showed him, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world. Notice that. It says, in a moment of time. Notice the word kingdom. Kingdom means rulership, means organization, structure, government. Okay? Structure. Not the earth, but structure of the world. How the world system, how the world thinks, the mindset of the world, Hollywood and all that, the news media, the whole arrangement. So he showed Jesus how things were running in his time. Okay, and it's in a moment in time, and, and the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that it is delivered unto me. You see that? It's delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. I will, I give it. So you see, Satan says, It has been delivered unto me. Who delivered it unto him? Adam and Eve in the garden. So Satan had a right, and he said to Jesus, I'll give you everything. I'll give you everything. And the same temptation, let me say this to you, is with us today. The same temptation makes us, many Christians, get politically correct and don't represent their faith because they're afraid of what the world will say. You, are, you can creatively talk to people who are not saved without compromising your faith. But a lot of people don't even try to. Instead, they compromise their faith. All because they don't want to lose out on the earth, quote unquote. Now, but let's go down and see. If thou therefore will worship me, all this shall be thine. Look at what Jesus said to him. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it's written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Jesus did not say it's a lie. If it was a lie, Christ would have said, Satan, you're lying. He did not challenge the veracity of that, of that statement. He didn't challenge the truthfulness of that statement, because he said it clearly, it's been delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. So the, the least holder, holding of the earth, the management of the earth, had been given to Adam. To, to Adam originally, and Adam, when he went through high treason, through, uh, through uh, uh, sin against the Father, gave the keys and the authority to Satan. But now when you become a Christian, the authority is given back to you. It's given back to you. Like, let's look at some scriptures, and then we're going to get into the issue of, of judgment. Uh, look, look at Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. It says, and he said unto them, or from, let's start from verse 18. I said unto them, behold, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Heaven where? What's heaven? The place of authority. Fall from heaven. Okay. Behold, this is speaking now. I give unto you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. Adam did not tread on that serpent in the garden. You see? So we've been, with this authority restored back to us. Adam did not do this. It says, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by enemies hurt you. Over all the power. In another place, in the book of, 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 um, of Ephesians chapter 6, it tells us that we are not unaware of the wiles, of the tricks of the devil. So we have authority over the power of the enemy, not just, no, no, we have authority over his power. We have delegated authority over his power. That means that when I'm not trying to fight with the devil, because the devil is, let me say, he's older than you and I. He's been there way before us. So if you want to measure power with the devil, probably he's more powerful than, than us. But that's not the issue. We have authority over him. It's like you can have somebody who has a nasty pit bull that can probably kill a person or that can hurt someone, rather. But that person is the owner of the pit bull. Therefore, he has authority over that pit bull. Okay, that's exactly how it is. We have authority over the devil. And that that's the same authority that Adam did not exercise in the garden. Our Lord Jesus said, I'm giving you that authority now. We have the authority restored back. Okay? He said it before the cross. Then after the cross, it was not actually ratified. After the cross, it was ratified. The, the, the contract was signed. It was signed, sealed, delivered back to man. Okay? But that authority is a spiritual authority because God is spirit. That authority is spiritual authority. Now, the authority over the earth will be physically delivered back to man, physically, when Christ comes to rule and reign again for a thousand years. And also later on, of course, the new heavens and new earth. Okay, but right now, it's a spiritual authority. We have the authority restored back to man again. Therefore, for man to function in that authority, he has to get born again. Okay, now, this is where we're going to judgment of the world. Let's go to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. So what happens when somebody does not hear the gospel? Let's, let's try and imagine somebody in some remote village or somebody even in America. Nobody has preached the gospel to them. 
There are people in America who have never heard the gospel. Believe you me. There are people in America who have seen churches. Okay? They see the buildings, they have, but they have never heard the gospel preached to them. They hear of Christians. They know, oh, these are Christians. But they never really heard anybody preach the gospel to them. Therefore, they are, they are innocent. They are ignorant. They are ignorant of the gospel. And that's because we Christians are not doing our job. We're not telling people about Jesus. Therefore, a lot of people are suffering. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me quickly say this again. When Adam and Eve sinned against God in Genesis 3, the Bible speaks about certain things that came on the earth. There were curses that came on the earth. Curses that were released on the earth. Because Satan, who is the devil, the evil one, who is evil, of course, the word de devil, the evil one, who is evil, wants nothing good for man. Satan, who is jealous of the fact that man has authority over the earth, Satan now is the architect, is the father of lies, the Bible says that. Of course, John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. He's not only stealing or trying to steal from Christians, he's not only trying to steal from, from Christians or people of faith, he's not trying to kill them or destroy them, he's trying to kill everybody. Christians are not Christians alive. Because everybody in the world who is not, people who are not Christians right now, they are potential Christians. You remember the story of Paul, Paul the Apostle, who was called Saul, going around persecuting the church. And in one moment, on the road to Damascus, he got converted and became the apostle. Wrote most of the New Testament. Okay, So everybody who is not saved, right? every human being on the earth, has the potential of being a Christian, of being the next Billy Graham. Somebody who is smoking weed and getting drunk and getting high and sleeping around and doing whatever they are doing, whatever kind of lifestyle they have, gay, straight, twisted, whatever it is, has the potential of being a powerful Christian, has the potential of being next Billy Graham, next C.J. Jakes, next Joyce Meyer, next Joseph Prince, Creflo, whoever. Somebody who is not, who, who doesn't, who hates God, who swears and curses all the time. If only somebody can preach the gospel to them. Okay? Now, Romans 2, from verse 12. We're going to read this portion. I'm going to read through to verse 29. Time is nearly spent. My goodness. Uh, okay. Romans chapter 12. Look at chapter 2 from verse 12. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the heirs of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Look at verse 14. For when the Gentiles which have not the law, do by nature the things command, command contained in the law, these have not having the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law in their uh, of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile accusing or else excusing them, and the day the Lord shall judge the secrets of men of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So people who die who did not hear the gospel of Christ, who did not hear the word of God, will be judged without the Bible, without the gospel of Christ. Okay? Now, what will they be judged by? They will be judged by what the Bible calls here the law of conscience. Now, hold your place in Romans 1. Look at John, John chapter 1. Look at John chapter 1. Look at John chapter 1. Look at verse 9. John chapter 1 and verse 9. John 1 and verse 9. It says there, speaking about Jesus, that was the true light which lighted every man that cometh into the world. So every man that comes to the world, everybody who is born into this world, has the spark of divinity. In, let me use that word put that way, in them. It's called conscience. Everybody who is born into this world has a conscience. Th that conscience excuses. Look at look go go back to Romans chapter two, chapter two. Romans chapter two. Look at verse 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 uh, verse fifteen which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, agreeing with the law. Look at what the conscience does. And their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing them. So in the conscience of every man, God has written the law of good and evil in the conscience of every man. Everybody knows when something is good and when something is bad. Everybody knows it. Everybody knows that certain type of behavior is bad, period. Everybody knows that stealing is that there's no no culture where where willy nilly stealing is okay. There's no culture where just killing somebody, murdering somebody without cause is okay. There's no culture like that. 
Now, when they fight wars, that's different. That's war. But I'm talking about just going after someone and just, just killing the person. There's no culture that that's, that's okay. No culture. There's no culture. So God will judge them by their conscience. God will, with their conscience, judge them. Okay? Now, but on the earth here, we have a responsibility to preach the gospel to them. Because some might say, well, if God's going to judge them by their conscience, why don't we leave them alone? So when they get to heaven, let God, let God sift and decipher who's going to come into heaven and who's not going to come into heaven. Some might say that. Remember, Jesus not only died for you to go to heaven. If Jesus died for us to go to heaven alone, the day you got born again, guess what happened? You'd have dropped dead immediately and gone to heaven. John 10.10, 10, part B, I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. I've come that you may have life and have it till it's full, until it overflows, maximize life. He said, in this world, I, I was, he said, the things I've spoken unto you, I've spoken to them that in this world you might have peace, in this, that you have tribulation, but be of good cheer. So Jesus did not, he knows that, look, we, we are on this, uh, the devil, the, the curse that came through Adam is still on the earth, even on unbelievers. Okay, but the church, we now, we are to tell the world, God is not mad at you anymore. The curse over your life has been broken. You don't have to live with turmoil anymore. You can live peaceably. You can live with joy. You can be healed. You can prosper. You can have, you know, you can have a, a, a great home. You can have a great family. You can have great careers. You know, God can, God favors on your life. So our purpose is not only to tell people about going to heaven, but tell them here on the earth here, the blessing of God, the favor of God, the smile of God is on you. The book of Psalm Chronicles 16 and verse 9 says, The eye of the Lord runs to and fro the earth, that he might show himself strong on the behalf of them who trust him. So God is trying to bless people, trying to wipe people's tears from people's eyes on the earth. Okay, He's trying to basically cancel out the effect of the curse. I, one of the things I say of times is that the word blessing means to be empowered to prosper. It means to be empowered to succeed. It means to be made happy. It also means to cancel out the curse. The word blessed. So when the Bible says, when we say we are blessed, when God said, when Jesus said in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who, what he's saying is this, that people who do certain things or people who are lined up with him or who are lined with him, they are happy people. They are people who happiness, who favor us on their lives. Okay, famous on the earth, on the earth. Even though the enemy, even though Satan, it, it, Satan seems to be the manager of things on the earth. Okay, but with the favor of God on their lives, they can cancel out the works of the devil. They can cancel out the effects of the devil. And we are called to be people who also uh, who are ambassadors of this same good news to tell other people who are living in the world here, not just only about heaven. Yes, if someone does not hear the gospel before they die, they go to, they go before God. Jesus will appear to them and say. I'm the one that put that in your conscience. And God will judge them based on their conscience. I believe that when people die before they go to heaven, okay, people who are who are not born again, before they enter into heaven, God is going to have, let me use what, an instant judgment for them and introduce them to Jesus. Now, how is he going to do that? I don't know how he's going to do that, the process. But that's when you look at the Bible, that's what it says. People don't go to heaven unless they come through Jesus. Therefore, if a man does not know Jesus, Jesus will introduce himself to the man. There's a scripture I, I could have shown you. When Jesus died on the cross, the Bible says that he went to preach the gospel to spirits that were in prison. People who were in the Old Testament, who had not received Jesus yet, who were in a place called Abraham's bosom. Okay, Jesus came to them and appeared to them and said, I am Jesus. I'm the one who you guys are looking forward to. And they welcomed him and accepted him. And that's why the Bible says that the graves opened up and people went up to heaven. You know, after Jesus resurrected, Jesus died and resurrected. They all went up to heaven. Now, the point I'm trying to make to you is this, that when somebody dies who is not born again, God will judge them according to the law of their conscience, and Jesus will introduce himself to them and say, hey, I am the one that wrote that law in your conscience. We saw that in John chapter 1 verse 9, and therefore they would embrace the truth of that. Okay, but those people who did not who did not follow their conscience, even that the Lord has written on their hearts, which was not uh, which is not necessarily what my call Bible. Those that did not follow it, they faced the lot of the sinner who who had said, who did, who rejected Jesus. So for people who did not hear the gospel, the conscience is like a gospel for them. Therefore, even they follow their conscience. When their conscience accuses or excuses them, when they follow their conscience, God will sovereignly, okay, God, sovereignty means God makes a decision, makes a choice to do or not to do. God will sovereignly decide how he'll deal with them in that sense. 
But the way you deal with them is this. Those that follow their conscience right, God will accept them into heaven. Those that did not, God will basically not accept them into heaven. Okay, but on the earth here right now, we are not to get lazy because some Christians say, well, well, if they're gonna, if they're not, if they're going to have any, the, if they follow their conscience right, maybe. So, are you gonna take a chance on somebody having to follow their conscience or not follow their conscience? No, I'll preach the gospel, the good news to them. Tell them you don't have to follow the law of the conscience. The law of the conscience is a lower law. You can follow the law of salvation. You can follow Christ. Okay, the devil doesn't have to be your master anymore. You don't have to be bound by all kinds of habits and all kinds of stuff. You don't have to be a slave to sin anymore. You can now accept Jesus and, and, and receive freedom from sin, but also receive God's empowerment, the favor, the grace, the joy, or the blessing of God. And therefore, you can live this victorious life that God promises on the earth.